I'm manager for Keysight Technologies. It is a pleasure and an honor to be here in front of you all and also to be part of this event. We are, for quite some time, very proud sponsors of the MTT and IMS event and actually ARFTAG as well uh, and even RFIC. So it's been a great uh, pleasure to be part of that so far. I hope everybody's having a good time at the show, learning a lot. Uh, it's pretty technical stuff. We're all technical people. I will talk a little bit about technology. Um, Keysight sells about uh, 1.6 billion, 1.5 billion dollars worth of test equipment, and test solutions into the communications industry every year. That's a pretty big part of our business, and therefore it remains very important for us to be on top of what's happening uh, in terms of spectrum policy and understanding how that affects you, understanding how that affects us, and even having some influence on what some of those policy changes might be. Uh, for about 75 years we've been in business and we've been impacted by spectrum policy for quite some time. Uh, back in the late 50s is when we introduced our first uh, I guess you could call it microwave signal generator, the 606 at uh, 65 megahertz, I believe. And uh, last year when we introduced a 110 gigahertz signal analyzer, and just this week introducing a 120 gigahertz vector network analyzer, uh, I think both of which you can see over at our booth, uh, all that's driven not just by what you want from a technology standpoint, but by what you are implementing to accommodate changes in policy and standards uh, relating to taking advantage of the spectrum and using it for all of what we want to use. So, given all of that, uh, I'm going to spend time talking only about three facets of spectrum policy. Uh, there are many more. Uh, you can read about this all the time, the FCC's webpage and the equivalent has updates on uh, more than a daily basis. So this moves pretty fast. And, uh, but I'm gonna focus on just three things. And one is the advent of millimeter wave. The second is the changes associated with carrier aggregation. And then the third will be the changes associated with spectrum sharing. First, a little bit of a history lesson. Who knows what this means? SOS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's a few folks out there that are ham operators, right? Uh, and uh, so that's SOS, Save Our Spectrum. It's hard to imagine a time when this was not the universal sign for distress. But there was indeed such a time. And uh, in fact, a standards body had to get together and make a decision about the use of this set of Morse code symbols as a universal sign of distress, primarily related to maritime uh, radio telegraph capabilities. And that and a number of other decisions got made between about 1906 and 1927 that had a pretty big impact on the use of spectrum and uh, how we command and control what sorts of things uh, spectrum are used for. This is a cover of an uh, initial publication by a body that ultimately became the International Telecommunications Union. Anyone here a member of ITU? Anyone knows who ITU is? All right. Anybody ever read this document? So if you open this document up on the web, and it's easy to find, it reads exactly like ITU publications that have been made in the last year. It's amazing how little things have changed. Um, now, between 1906 and 1927, a number of decisions were made, uh, starting with uh, a universal acceptance that 50 kilohertz would be the international uh, distress channel. This would be the signal, SOS, and uh, that after the Titanic disaster, that every ocean-going vessel was required to monitor 50 kilohertz all the time, 24-7, so that they could respond in case it was needed. Number of interesting decisions made, and really, kind of the first uh, decisions 
around controlling the spectrum and managing communications. And this is while I believe the founder of radio communications was still alive. And uh, so it's moved a little bit since then. And over the course of a history, uh, there's been a number of examples. Now most of what I have on this list are examples from the United States, but there are similar decisions that were made around the world, uh, starting from discovering the need to standardize and set policy, moving into a command and control central uh, place. So in, who's a ham radio operator here? All right. Either of you guys. Was your dad a ham radio operator? Yeah. No? Yes for Roger. Okay, so was his dad a ham radio operator? Probably not. Well, does anybody know that in World War I in 1917 in the United States, it was illegal for consumers to use radio, right? So consumer access to radio is not legal. It's a perfect example of command and control management of spectrum. Now that was a defense issue, but radio was, was uh, verboten for uh, for uh, at least folks in the United States. But that moved on to a little bit of trust busting that went on, uh, the elimination of uh, chain broadcasting and moving NBC from a single large broadcasting company into two and then ultimately another one came about. These companies are still around. But I think one of the largest changes in spectrum policy that really impacted our business from a commercial communications standpoint uh, but to some extent also what goes on in the aerospace defense world was the move from the command and control to more of a market-based approach with these large spectrum auctions that started in the early 90s as we were moving into 2G communications, initial auctions in the United States for the 1900 megahertz bands, followed by the PCS auctions in Europe, uh, which actually generated a lot more money and caused a lot more problems, in fact. And auctions that are happening today. And then that's moving to something that's even more interesting, which is licensed shared spectrum. So it behaves kind of like a common spectrum, a little bit like Wi-Fi right now. Wi-Fi is shared spectrum, right? But it's not licensed. In a licensed shared spectrum, the rules are gonna be a little bit different. We'll talk about that. A number of announcements uh, we've seen over the last couple of years, various bodies around the world making announcements about making spectrum available, asking for convergence, uh, managing a lot of things. Most recently, the 600 megahertz auction closing in the United States, this incentive auction, very complex, very interesting. But you notice every one of those had slightly different frequencies. And uh, this is one of the problems with spectrum policy is that spectrum policy is not made by one body around the world, it's made by many. You could say that the ITU is one body, but getting the ITU to agree on anything takes a month. And they don't agree, that's a one month meeting based on a five year agenda. And they don't always agree on uh, everything, and so you end up with spectrum that's split up into many different bands. We all deal with that. And a perfect example is what's happening in 3GPP. Because of spectrum policy, you've got a standards body that is now over 50 different bands identified for LTE. Well, what does that mean? Everybody's front end module has to operate across a bunch of different bands. Your radios have to move around. I believe in uh, your typical iPhone, there's over 20 cellular bands that this thing serves at any one time. That's pretty hard to implement in something that I only spend too much money on. Um, and this, thing's, this makes things very complex, but that's because policy is set different in Japan than it is in the United States, than it is in Europe, than it is in Taiwan. And we have to have our devices work everywhere. So to get more data, we start to aggregate these channels. They're split all over the place. Let's add some channels. We'll talk a little bit about carrier aggregation. Release 10, 3GPP, there were three possible carrier aggregation combinations. A carrier aggregation started back in 3G with adding dual channel for HSPA, and uh, it's really become running rampant in the LTE space with now, uh, each one of those is additive. So uh, that means there are 540 possible carrier aggregation combinations. Now I am glad 
that I am not trying to implement that in my cellular modem I see. I am glad you are, and you're buying my test equipment, because this is hard to test. It's hard to manage. Um, and it makes things very complex. Frankly, this is about getting more bandwidth in the context of some pretty tough policy situations that have been set around the world, based on history, based on different countries making different decisions. Are we going to fix that problem? Uh, the ITU is going to centralize on a single band for millimeter waves we move uh, WRC 2019? I don't think so. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but a short look at this wonderful slide that was put together by David Pelkey of Skyworks uh, gives you an idea that uh, the bands that are being used, there's some harmonization, but they're still very different. And perfect example, a millimeter wave, US, Japan, and Korea, 28 gigahertz is fine. We're going to go down that path and implement cellular and 28 gigahertz, hopefully make that work. In Europe, that's not going to work. 28 gigahertz is used very heavily for backhaul, and uh, so they're at a band right below that. So we're already proliferating more bands. That's good news for us, because I sell test equipment. That's bad news for you, because you have to buy it. Um, so our job is to do what we can to make that easy and affordable for you. Let's talk about spectrum sharing. So it's pretty easy to get people to agree on how to use exclusive license spectrum. Everybody agrees. I may not be happy that you own spectrum and I don't, but it's set by policy. Everybody agrees on how to use that spectrum. Well, the keynote speaker at the plenary session two nights ago Dr. Dr. Schultz, will you know? I hope I'm saying that gentleman's name right. He said something I loved. He said, in spectrum sharing, you always have two parties, a enthusiastic party and a reluctant party. Well, this is what that looks like. Um, and a lot of times in sharing, there are big users. Take, for example, the CBRS in the United States, the Citizens Broadband Radio System, where the big incumbent user happens to be the federal government or various entities therein, and uh, they may be the reluctant party. The enthusiastic party might be the people that want to use that. Now, if you look at this picture, it actually looks like that one is enthusiastic and this one is reluctant. But in the case of spectrum sharing, it's just the opposite. That guy was pretty enthusiastic about the spectrum, and this guy doesn't want to have anything to do with it. So this is a tough policy decision, and it does mean complex radio systems. It means uh, maybe a real-time spectrum brokerage, and uh, uh, certainly cognitive radio, uh, which is a great opportunity, but it's, it's going to be a significant technology demand for us. And then, of course, we go to millimeter wave. So this is a depiction that uh, my uh, colleague, Bob Cutler, who is retired, uh, put together to show spectrum that is currently allocated and then some spectrum that is either in the process of being allocated or will be in the next few years here in the white for a licensed spectrum below 6 gigahertz. Uh, it's pretty good news, right? We could be doubling the amount of spectrum available to this commercial communications industry, uh, but the reason why we moved to millimeter wave is that, at least in the United States, with what the FCC has done, uh, we've added uh, a significant amount of licensed spectrum to be used in the millimeter wave space, and you can see how the bandwidth difference is dramatic. And if you add to that the unlicensed picture, it's a pretty compelling picture if we can get the radio systems to work. It's really all about this part of the Shannon Hartley theorem, and as long as you ignore that little noise power issue, uh, the, uh, the capacity just keeps going up. Now, you can't really ignore that little noise power issue, but uh, this is why we're doing millimeter wave. It is a way to get more, more capability out of the system. Is that Alan Henley back there? I haven't seen you in about 20 years. Uh, we'll have to talk. We'll have to talk. Lots of challenges in millimeter wave. Complicated tables put by people. I'm going to simplify this. We have much higher frequencies. Because we want that bandwidth, we're going to higher bandwidths. 
There's a lot higher path loss. It's just built into the equations. So there's a link budget challenge, and we have a lot more data we're moving through our systems. So high frequencies, we've got calibration issues, redesigning of amplifiers, power efficiency issues, new antenna designs. The IF is broader, keeping it flat and behaving well is key. Noise power is higher. Path loss, we've got to deal with antennas that are controlled by the Mac, code books, calibration of antennas. It's a new world for the communications industry, for at least the commercial industry. And we have a lot more data. We're moving data around inside these devices at rates that are really high. So uh, 2K video, I think, is 9 gigabits per second to the screen. Uh, so we're moving information around in our devices a lot faster, and that consumes a lot of power, both at the RF and at the baseband. A number of challenges, and that does not count all of the system challenges in terms of initial access, dealing with channel issues, reflection issues, that kind of thing. So why am I here? Why am I telling you all of this stuff? Well, this is one of most engineers' favorite quotes. If you can't measure it and put it in numbers, you don't know much about it. Everybody likes Lord Kelvin's quote. I particularly like it because, of course, we're a measurement company. Uh, but it is important for you to know whether your system is working and, in fact, how well it is working. So what are we doing about this and what should you do? Prepare your teams. Uh, we have training programs going on in Keysight right now, helping people, a larger number of people, understand a number of these challenges and complexities. And getting close to the customers and to the policy makers and standards bodies to be right on top of where this is headed is also really key, and even taking advantage of the opportunity to influence that. And one more thing, recognize that what, you know, policy sets the framework outside of all of this, and then things get standardized, but what actually gets implemented is a subset of that, and so on and so on, and ultimately what you're going to make money on might be a fairly small part of that. So being close to this industry is pretty important to understand where you should go. So just a couple of examples of what we're doing. Um, the light's still green, I just want to make sure I'm okay. One, in the millimeter wave space, uh, we developed a channel sounding capability that uses our test equipment, but has some pretty fancy software to help people understand the nature of the millimeter wave channel. And among the places where this is being used, is the University of Bristol associated with work they're doing on their own, but also with work they're doing with a European-sponsored uh, research program called MM Magic, and uh, making measurements on the millimeter wave channel. In this case, at 60 gigahertz, you can see the antenna systems that they're using. Um, some pretty interesting material here. You can look this up uh, or get requests, and we can send you the papers on this. But a couple of key outcomes, reflection analysis, so different materials reflect things differently, as you can imagine. And uh, maybe different material types, but also the texture of the material, so uh, the difference between specular and non-specular reflection, which has an impact not just on how many lines of, or non-line of sight paths you're gonna get, but also how it impacts polarization. A lot of people are looking to use polarization as a MIMO approach in millimeter wave, but as soon as those waves hit a surface, they come back with a different polarization, and you could end up uh, having problems with a, uh, a change in your orthogonality. Uh, the diffraction models are also getting a lot of attention, not just here, but in other projects. And how well do these waves diffract around corners? Uh, how soon do you lose your signal, blockage, that kind of thing. There's a number of very important uh, mapping and uh, channel modeling techniques that come out of this. Uh, other examples in the phased array antenna area. I like to tell my teams that the reason why we do phased array antennas is because once we put millimeter wave radios in all of our smartphones, what we're not going to want to do is put those horn antennas like on the end of the smartphone and always be pointing them to where they need to go because we need higher gain to overcome the path loss and that higher gain comes from a high gain antenna and the only way to steer that antenna around and manage the beam was with a phased array uh, of some sort. And so we spent a lot of time in this area as well. 
uh, and you can see some announcements that we made recently and also get some demonstration in our booth of some work we've done with uh, UC San Diego with uh, their 28 gigahertz link which they set up and made a bunch of successful measurements for a 300 meter link here and a, a lot of what people are wondering about is how well are these links going to work you can see the uh, uh, the IQ diagrams here for uh, what's been implemented at least 16 QAM uh, and uh, found that uh, uh, Gabriel Obese and friends did some pretty interesting work by having a signal to noise limitation only and EVM versus beam angle is in pretty good shape and I'm fairly certain that these antennas did not need a significant amount of calibration. So a lot of measurement capability to understand how well they are going to work went into this. It was, it was fun to be part of this and to help with them. Unrelated to that, antenna, uh, antennas with power amplifiers on them need power amplifiers that are efficient. And efficiency comes in a number of different ways, but uh, one possibility is digital pre-distortion, and this is some work we did with Skyworks to prove out that, indeed, DPD with only a 3x bandwidth um, at a millimeter wave frequency, we could make some significant improvements in EVM, and uh, uh, actually do some fairly impressive work to improve linearity of these devices. Uh, and some would say maybe we won't implement DPD at millimeter wave, but at least uh, we have numerical analysis to suggest that it could make a difference. A couple other things that we do uh, is, uh, I talked about spectrum sharing. Well, people are going to want to stay on top of what is happening out there. So some of the tools, one example uh, is our uh, handheld analyzer. There's, you can see that at the booth if you want. And this is work um, that uh, now is implemented up at 50 gigahertz and we're able to do uh, real-time spectrum monitoring to help people understand what's happening in their environment. And, uh, and then for carrier aggregation, again, just examples of what's going on, what we're doing. Uh, in, in this case, uh, we made this announcement a year ago, supporting five component carriers on a network emulator to prove out uh, this thing called Gigabit LTE. We did a major announcement with Qualcomm last year uh, on their Snapdragon processors. It was very exciting to see these things be done and see what happens. So, uh, I won't make too much of a shameless plug out of this, but uh, so the question is, are we going to make this millimeter wave stuff work in the commercial wireless industry? Does anybody know? Anybody have a prediction? It's pretty hard to predict this stuff. Let me show you some history. I think people have seen a lot of these things, but I believe Western Union set their last telegraph uh, a couple of years ago. And I still have a phone. Uh, our favorite Lord Kelvin was somewhat skeptical about air travel and air transportation. This was a quote he made about two years before the Wright brothers did their first flight. Uh, one of the smartest people ever lived didn't think the nuclear power was a possibility. And uh, this gentleman miscalculated the size of the computer market by 10 orders of magnitude. Um, so the one guy that got prediction right was this one. Now, he may not have been the first person that said this, but maybe he said it the best. And that is that prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. I remember when I first started uh, learning about cellular, they were telling me about GSM, this is after we got done with AMPS, and they showed me about SMS, the text messages, right? I thought that was the dumbest thing you could ever do. Who would ever want to send a short message? I probably got 15 of them today, folks. So it is not easy to predict the future, and there's a lot of smart people in this room that will probably make that future real. So we spend a lot of time on that. We help make those measurements in, uh, in a number of different areas. Um, and I like to use this quote that came from Lord Kelvin's notebooks, uh, in which he quoted Alexander Pope. I particularly like the part I put in red. Measure earth, weigh air, and state the tides. And we do a little bit more of that, um, but uh, this is all about getting a nice numerical understanding of what's going on, trying to figure out how that spectrum policy is going to impact the technology and uh, where we're headed with a number of these challenges. And then my own quote, which is, you better figure out how to do this uh, 
fast, cheap, and accurately, or your MIMO will be of a meager and unsatisfactory kind. So thank you very much. I appreciate your attention, and I have four minutes for questions. That means my the person after me has more time to set up. That's okay. All right, uh, I'm open to questions after this. I'm around at the show for another hour or so, so uh, it's a pleasure to see you all here, and I wish you the best for the rest of the day.